Hello, uh, so I have been uh, advised to jump right in, uh, so that's what I'm going to do. Uh, what caught my interest uh, in the research field of nostalgia was actually how nostalgia has been for a long time being used to explain a various number of phenomena. It first appeared, uh, of course, within the post-socialist context, uh, within uh, where uh, the explanations have been that uh, socialist uh, nostalgics uh, have been the ones who were actually the so-called transition losers, uh, so people who did not manage to adapt to the newly circumstances of market economy and democratic institutions. Uh, but then it started shifting in the recent years um, as something that's been used to explain uh, a number of political phenomena and also in the Western world. But it kept uh, within some quantitative uh, research that you can see here, kind of pointing out into the direction of the losers, the nostalgic losers. The presentation here is based on the research I did for my PhD thesis, which had for the main research question to understand what is the meaning of Yugo nostalgia for a very specific generation, the generation of the last pioneers, uh, and how does it translate into the political field within the post Yugoslav concept. So I was looking at the intersection of the three concepts of generation memory and nostalgia. Um, the last pioneers uh, are people who were born uh, between 1974 and 1982, um, and who still carry a specific sense of a generation, what we can call a political generation. Um, they see themselves very distinctly uh, from the generation of their parents who were actually um, what are sometimes called the last Yugoslav people who lived in the socialist Yugoslav times and from the generation of their parents or the young people who were born after the country uh, was already torn apart. Uh, I've spent uh, about uh, two years in Slovenia, Croatia and Serbia. I've been conducting uh, in-depth qualitative interviews uh, which really based on the life narratives of the last pioneers who are today politically active um, and on their reflections, how their memories uh, feed um, into their understanding of the world today, into their uh, political positionality and their political activism. Uh, what is important just to understand that uh, since the main focus was to really discuss with people belonging to the generation of the last pioneers in the three countries aforementioned. Um, of course, uh, some of the characteristics of the sample just followed the political reality. Um, and the political reality is that the male uh, sex is overrepresented um, in politics today, um, that uh, also uh, most of the people, like 90% of my sample, actually had tertiary education. Um, so I was not trying to change this, but um, it also shows uh, what is the current situation among political activists in the post-Yugoslav uh, space. Uh, also, uh, about a third, they were members of parliament at the time uh, of the research, because in the, all of the three countries, uh, there were elections in subsequent years. Um, 25, 26% uh, pro were part of uh, members, political parties, but not represented in the parliament, not themselves members of parliament. Um, there was 13% um, who be belonged to a number of political parties, initiatives, movements um, at the very local grassroots level. So they participated, uh, some of them in the local government, but those were the movements that even didn't have um, an intention to be part uh, of national politics, at least uh, in the time of the research. Um, and then of course, there was a large number of people who were politically active through uh, various means. So I took political activism in the widest possible uh, sense. Another important uh, element uh, of the sample um, is that a large majority, 58%, uh, uh, have self-identified as left-wing. Here it is important to say that I have decided not to be the one um, 
imposing uh, to my interviewees uh, where they or their political party stand on the political spectrum, but I have left um, this to them to self-identify and explain their political positionality themselves. Um, and as you can see, there, there is also um, a significant percentage of people who were either identifying a center or uh, completely trying to deny the adequacy of the usual left-right uh, political cleavage, the traditional one that we use in political science today. Um, and I think this is something that reflects um, the global changes in politics today that more and more um, the traditional cleavage of left and right is being uh, put into question. And this is also reflected in some of uh, the answers. Um, this is just a diagram to show um, the overall research results uh, of uh, for my PhD thesis. Um, while in this presentation, uh, of course, uh, I'm going to be uh, focused uh, very specifically on the question of Yugoslavism and Yugoslavia and what are those contents and how are they important for the political field today. Um, as you can see, the diagram shows basically the life narratives of the last pioneers. Uh, so how they, uh, they grew up, how do they remember their uh, childhood, so which values were important for them while growing up. Um, then, of course, there was uh, this overnight uh, rupture in their narratives, their life stories, uh, which was brought by the dissolution of Yugoslavia and the Yugoslav wars. Um, and then in their adulthood, uh, where they describe their understanding, because as we know, memories are always constructed in the relation with the present. Um, the most saturated code emerging was a negative present. Uh, so for all of the interviewees, um, actually their evaluation of contemporary uh, situation in their countries and the world uh, is pretty dim, so to say. Um, and then in the end, we would discuss uh, the importance of the Yugoslav identity for them. What does uh, Yugoslavia even mean today? Um, is it just spatial and cultural? Is it uh, some sort of metanational identity? And what is Yugoslavia? Um, does it really have a subversive political potential, uh, like uh, a number of researchers have claimed so far? Or is it completely impotent uh, to actually create uh, a political action? So discussing what does it mean um, when we say Yugoslavia today, what, what are their first associations on Yugoslavia today? Um, of course, the first and foremost is a feeling of home. Um, and when we say home, uh, there are two important aspects. It could be understood uh, in temporal terms, so home that they have lost. Um, in terms of the borders of Yugoslav state uh, before it fell apart, um, or if uh, they have undergone an experience um, of dislocation as being refugees or had to move due to, to, um, to the war uh, context, uh, or in spatial terms uh, where whenever now, today, they're actually traveling throughout the post-Yugoslav space, um, the borders remain brief um, and annoying uh, elements uh, in some space which they consider um, is equally home um, as the nation state in which uh, they live uh, today. Um, of course, there's the notion of economic and cultural space. I'm not going to, to expand on this because I think that those are the two elements um, that have mostly been researched so far, um, either from the perspective of uh, all the regional Western Balkans uh, initiatives, accession to European Union, um, various uh, initiatives of free trade agreements, uh, et cetera, or the cultural space uh, where uh, we always discuss uh, the issue of cooperation uh, between the artists, the intellectuals, the academic community, um, or uh, there, there is a number of even initiatives uh, that have been locally brought, like a declaration on a common language um, that uh, was signed in 2017 uh, by a number of uh, linguists uh, from the region, which tried to point out um, the artificial creation of so-called new languages uh, separating uh, what was once Serbo-Croatian today into 
uh, Bosniak, uh, Croatian, Serbian, and Montenegrin. Um, and actually, from that part of the idea of the cultural space, some of the interviewees uh, have pointed out that this whole understanding um, of Yugoslav space and even claiming that um, the Yugoslav space still exists today is uh, something that belongs to elites. Um, not only economic elites, uh, which of course, uh, as we know, capital has uh, no borders, uh, but um, also the cultural capital um, elites. Um, and as we might know uh, from, from uh, other fields like uh, migration studies, of course, uh, migration and mobility are completely differently uh, understood. Uh, whether uh, we come uh, from higher socioeconomic classes or uh, from the perspective of blue collar uh, migrant workers. Uh, when discussed what is Yugoslav identity for them, uh, of, it had a very important element um, of an understanding of anti-nationalist identity and an identity um, that tries to defy both local um, nationalisms um, and imposed uh, new ethnonational identities which happened overnight uh, with the rupture of the dissolution. Um, but then also uh, sometimes it was uh, evoked uh, as um, an important signifier against the Western gaze um, because uh, when we say the Balkans as we know um, it is the Balkan other um, by Maria Todorova uh, the whole concept um, of what uh, Balkanist uh, determination means. Um, and uh, Yugoslav identity uh, represents for the last pioneer um, also an identity uh, which is actually more Western uh, in a way and still belongs um, to the Western world uh, as opposed to the Balkan identity which belongs to the East. Um, and also for a number of uh, interviewees, well, Yugoslav identity was important because it was actually the last time when they really felt um, a connection uh, with the state that they were living in. Um, so a large number of them would express uh, difficulties with establishing any kind of emotional uh, connection to the nation states um, that today constitute um, their institutional uh, framework. Um, as I have said, uh, there has um, the whole reflection on Yugoslavism, Yugoslavia, Yugoslav memories today for the generation of the last pioneers is most strongly marked by the idea of negative present. Um, and that is uh, exactly uh, what it means um, in terms of neoliberal economic policies um, that all of the post uh, Yugoslav countries have suffered. Um, the so-called transition and austerity pol policies and politics um, has uh, significantly impoverished um, the region and has significantly lowered um, the quality of life of post-Yugoslav citizens. Uh, and in this facing of negative post-Yugoslav present, looking back into the Yugoslav past, um, is actually now its concepts of socialist Yugoslav states are being rethought. Um, and that, that is in a way this, pay, this place uh, where by Rothbard's concept of multidirectional memory also new possibilities and open spaces for solidarity um, are uh, being born. Um, and in order to, to construct and to understand how Yugoslavism today for the last pioneers um, has been actually an anti-nationalist strategy uh, because what is interesting to note is that the, for the majority of the political activists uh, I have interviewed, their uh, entrance into the politics has actually been anti-nationalism and anti-capitalism has entered into the scene uh, much later. Um, and this of course was uh, expressed uh, through a number of uh, what I call intimate resistance strategies, uh, whether it would be um, declaring yourself as Yugoslav, even though this is not necessarily something um, essentially important for you. Um, a couple of interviewees uh, have also um, evoked that uh, they would, especially in their adolescent times, 
uh, have a tendency to always fall in love uh, with uh, members of so-called other ethno-national um, group and that um, they believe today that it was uh, a sort of expression of, of um, resistance uh, towards the, the nationalism today. Uh, sometimes it was like in the example we can see buying certain newspapers uh, or going um, on a book fair uh, where one interview she said uh, was uh, majoritarily uh, having uh, the right wing and uh, nationalist publishers present. Um, and so she decided to buy a book uh, on Yugoslavism by Predrag Matevich, uh, one of the cult writers um, in post Yugoslav space. Um, so she could walk, walk uh, proudly uh, around the book fair uh, carrying this book uh, in order to, um, as most of they say, to get on their nerves. Um, and, and then in the interview she said, yeah, but you know, now I have it, so I'm going to read it. Um, so, so as I have said for a number of the last pioneers, anti-nationalism and expressing uh, through this intimate uh, resistance strategies, it was also a certain point for them entering into activism. Um, and then only with the transition and of course their growing up and their political maturity, um, anti-capitalism uh, came uh, along. Uh, but uh, also it is important to know that anti-capitalism brought a number of rank wing activists um, also together. So these two categories, even though they do represent uh, two key elements um, of what could be understood uh, as a uh, nostalgic political um, background today, do not necessarily always go together. Um, and as much as also from the mainstream discourses perspective, um, anti-Yugoslavism doesn't always go uh, with anti-communism. A number of right-wing um, activists uh, were very open to reflecting a potential idea of a federation, confederation of Yugoslav states uh, through their positioning against uh, the neoliberal capitalism against the European Union. Uh, well, of course, uh, they would never uh, want to see it happening uh, under uh, communist um, ideology. So, so I think a, a very important um, point here to understand um, that is exactly the solidity of political identities um, today and um, ex exactly that exiting out of the trend traditional cleavages as they have been understood uh, within the political science uh, so far. So, so much more complexity um, on the political subjectivity um, actually uh, goes out today. Um, needless to say, of course, uh, beyond the economic and the cultural cooperation, uh, political cooperation started to further develop um, in the last years, um, and uh, an example uh, was just given uh, in July 2020, uh, when a number of left-wing uh, political parties uh, have issued a common declaration on regional solidarity, and those were exactly the groups uh, from Slovenia, Croatia, and Serbia. Um, a large number of my interviewees uh, came from these organizations and political parties. This was truly a development that happened uh, within the time of my research uh, until now, um, today. Um, so, so it is uh, most certainly uh, a movement, uh, a phenomenon that is very much in flux and in development. Um, and I believe that that's why it's, under, it's important to understand um, that Yugonostalgia was actually this very kernel, this very um, point of departure uh, for reflection on Yugoslavia and for actually uh, true deep political articulation um, of both what has been part of the institutional uh, regime and system in socialist Yugoslav times, uh, but also in the reflection of the reconstruction of post-Yugoslav space uh, today. Um, and to um, Yugos Yugonostalgia was on one side a safe space for a number of cognitive dissonances um, that the, the last pioneers were facing uh, in their memory narratives because there was a, a lot of 
uh, discordant uh, and even contradicting uh, voices that they were facing. Uh, but then from there, it further developed um, into actually a political impulse um, that I believe will be strongly marking um, the left wing, uh, especially uh, community in the future as the generation of the last 10 years uh, is becoming more and more relevant in the political uh, space because we are also witnessing just in the last couple of years um, this sort uh, of generational shift. And that's why in 2020 uh, it is possible to see illustrations like this one that we are seeing by a Bosnian illustrator where we have symbols uh, of Sarajevo, Zagreb and Belgrade um, on the anniversary of Srebrenica genocide uh, overlooking um, the graveyard of genocide victims. Thank you very much.